Welcome to the Brothers of Liberty, episode three, uh, part two. Just a whole bunch of shit we're gonna just gonna talk about. Just gonna shoot the shit for the most part. I'm gonna say shit one more time just because. And Cody, shit. booyah. How's it going? Uh, yeah, so, so we're gonna bullshit a little bit more here. I think you wanted to talk about uh, the Last of Us two. Yes, I have played and beaten the Last of Us two. And. Well, the the last last game I played was that uh, Ghost of Tsushima. Uh, that is a beautiful game. I fucking love that I, game. I heard that it was great. I'm much more of a strategy gamer type of guy, and I also play like I play like Total War. Oh, I fucking um, love Total War. I have like fourteen hundred hours in Shogun Two, eight hundred, actually a thousand hours now in Rogue Two, five hundred hours in Warhammer Two. The last. Cause like the last game I played of like that, I mean I have Civilization Six. Um, but other than that, yeah, I've noticed there's a big diff. Like I was like, wait, so traders are the you 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 can only make roads with traders now. That, that that's kind of strange, but okay. Um, I under I understand, but you know you get it's kind of like just one of those things you get used to something and then it changes and it's like oh okay yeah, well I, just gotta go with it. Gotcha. Um, but anyways... Make civilization great again. Yes, make civilization great. Uh, but uh, anyways, um, I want to talk about The Last of Us 2 because it's another one of the very many things that go along with this culture war that's kind of happening. And uh, it is quite possibly one of the most fascinating video games I think to ever come out in the last ever well, first off, I mean, you have you played the first one by any chance? No, no, but I, I have a buddy. Like, you're not going to ruin spoilers for me. I already... Okay. Well... I kind of know a little bit about it, but I also know a lot more of the... I'm into more of the cultural stuff that went around with it. Because I, gotcha. Because I personally think the public and the, the public's response to stuff like that is really telling. And I, I, think, I think it's actually going to predict f- the future of politics in some way. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll just give a relatively brief but awesome backstory. Uh, the Last of Us, the very first one, part one, is, in my personal view, it's a very simple story, but it's a story that was um, unbelievably necessary, brilliant, and I think just in terms of probably two of the best unlikely characters to actually get along with one another, it was a beautifully moving tale and one that, you know, shows that video games can actually be a very strong medium for storytelling you know i love movies and all that shit and plays etc etc and well it's understandable It's specific, um, you know. I feel you. Yeah. That's why, like, uh, that's why, like, like Star Trek movies always suffer mainly due to the reality that they can't put an entire season of their incredible, surprisingly level detail philosophy and political theory. I actually think is that really goes into it. Um, but I, yeah. but uh, yeah, with, I but with The Last of Us though, it's. I mean, there's a reason why I won a bunch of the Game of the Year awards, and it actually came out, I think, in a very fascinating time in 2013 when, you know, it, it was trending in that direction of, like, you know, anti-establishment stuff, you know, you, or you know what I'm saying, like, it was... Right, and, and, and now we live in a time where the establishment is anti-establishment. Now, it... it
but the anti-establishment people have lost, like, have forgotten that now, like, have not realized yet that all of a sudden the establishment supports everything that they do. It's also... It's interesting, because, you know, a lot of the time when, like, remakes or sequels end up happening, especially uh, lately, they tend to have, you know, they, they tend to have different creators behind it. But Neil Drunkman, I think, is the, the game's uh, main creator and director, and he uh, purposely made the sequel this way. It was started, The production actually started right after. And The Last of Us 2 was probably one of the most single-hyped games in the last three or four years. You know, every little thing. They wanted to see the continuation of this of this beautiful story that's basically like a, a mother do- or a father daughter kind of kind of tale going on here and yeah but then it, it still gets outsold by Zelda Breath of the Wild and exactly <laughs> but, I, I mean, but I, in fairness it got it, well in fairness it got well, outsold because the leaks started coming out unfortunately for uh, The Last of Us 2 very early of and spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't played the game uh, the death of Joel etc etc uh, in the way he dies, and the other playable character that everyone has made a shit ton of memes about at this particular point in time, Abby, who is a very interesting character. I guess what I'm trying to say is in terms of... So... So the backlash is just, it's obvious, it's just negative, everyone hates it because of them tearing down, you know, this great story in order to promote this weird, clearly SJW agenda, but the, the story itself I think is really fascinating, it's so much worse, but at the same time it's kind of like, how do I explain it? They make no apologies for what they're trying to do for the most part. And it's very clear that they're just going to go in this direction and they're not looking back. So in a lot of ways, I kind of understand that and kind of, you know... Well, I mean, I personally have no problem with people trying to put, you know, their their agenda behind their Oh yeah, it's well. And in fairness, it's it's not that it's, it's an unplayable game. It's just you know the whole point of the story, which makes it a really incredible game to play, is when you play as Joel or you play as Ellie, for instance, in the first game. You know you connect with their character, and it makes the actual gameplay itself. When you go into the certain scenes, obviously with story, like the whole point of the video game and the story driven video game is to basically, you're actually the fundamental character in the movie itself. And you're actually physically there and you control what destiny they choose for the most part. And you know, whether you, exactly like, and, and, in in a lot of ways, like a lot of those single play, like if you could be Kratos, for instance, in fucking God of war, you know, you're going to choose, your own path obviously if you can you know but you know you embody that character and the fundamental difference with this game is that you know they they messed up ellie not in a i don't even want to say in a negative way i actually in a lot of ways like ellie's character uh, the biggest fundamental problem is every other character that's that's just around her for the most part and the way that that the story is driven doesn't really give ellie's character anything to do for the most part because they're trying to promote the other character that i want to talk about right now is abby who who basically looks like if lou ferrigno put on a wig and it's really beautiful have you've seen it right like like it is it's when you play it you think it's a dude and 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 you know they have a Like that, 
Because that's been, um, they, you know, they keep attacking video games that accentuate female characteristics. Mm Mm-hmm. Because of boobs. Are they attractive to, uh, to, like, you know, to the base instincts of, it, of the dudes that they're trying to play this, you know, or even girls who are like, yeah, whatever, chicks got big tits, I want to play the game. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're putting so much into the other stuff that they're that they're losing out. But it's just funny, yeah, like, I, I, I saw stuff like that and I'm like, that's, wait, that's it, like, it was, it was kind of obvious that it was a female character, but mm-hmm. that you could tell that they were trying to make this like amorphous, highly te- you know, testosteroneized version of a female, right? I guess because mm-hmm. a lot of it, it, it's weird. Um, I read this weird scientific study um, that people have found that like when women are more aggressive they wind up having more testosterone in their system. And one thing we have seen the birth of is an attack on traditional femininity and um, when it comes to women Mm -hmm. and a, this growth of like the aggressive aggro woman. So I think that we're seeing, especially people, especially women that are more, you know, inclined to get into something like, game development, get into more STEM field, a lot of them, there have been a lot of them that will be that more type of aggressive, and this is how they, I think that's how they see themselves, um, as that, like, strong, muscly, you know, physically dominant female, like that, mm-hmm. uh, but, but I, to me, it's just, seeing female characters like that, to me, is, is very, very I don't want to say funny, but it's very humorous. Well, because that type of character doesn't connect with anybody. Well, it doesn't it doesn't connect not in the obvious way for them I mean, the sheer reality of the actual physicality of the character. It doesn't connect because when you see that character and that character literally does the same specific, I guess you could say, gender norms that you would probably attribute to a normal female, like an average female. And I just thought it was a very fundamentally odd choice that really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like, the entire time in the... First off, I just want to point out, too. You know there's a sex scene in the game with Abby's character. And, and it, I was waiting to bring that up because I, I thought that was fucking hilarious when I found out. Because apparently mm-hmm. the guy that did it that, mm-hmm. was that like, shoehorned the idea in also was the one that was like, No, you know what? We need to do this um, with bodysuits and motion capture to make it really Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and then he made himself be the one that got to, you know, film it and, you know, doing that shit. And to of me, course. I thought, was, I thought that was hilarious. So I'm like, this is, this is an expression of the stere- of all of the negative stereotypes that are that have mm-hmm. begun to be get- attached to this realm of the social. Because the the most rapey weirdo guys on, per capita are like the male feminist mm-hmm. weirdos that get close to women and then and then get aggressive with them, you know. Because your average Joe doesn't need to do that. Like mm-hmm. I don't need to. Like, I don't consider myself a feminist, and I've never had the need to. You know, it, it's just the you very much see that. Physically less, physically and mentally less impressive, beta male type of dude that probably would have been a pedophile in the Catholic Church 200 years ago. Uh, type dudes that get into that stuff, and to me, it's it's very very telling that you're seeing this stuff expressed just absolutely outright in video games. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also I, I think. The, the the most important takeaway here is a lot of the, the cultural backlash that happened because it, it, it's 
it's making people that are uninitiated get initiated into culture war, political war, BS, because one of the reasons why a douche, like, your average person doesn't pay attention to a lot of the stuff is they've got nothing making them. <laughs> okay, well, now you're screwing with their video game. Now you're screwing with what is effectively their outlet that distracts them from the BS and from the real world and from all of that. And I, I because you have a lot of people that are like, yeah, dude, I don't care if you're gay or lesbian or whatever, but you're making the game bad. I spent 60 bucks on this game and it sucks. Mm-hmm. And, okay. and, and like, and that, that's what I think is going to be probably the largest takeaway from stuff like The Last of Us is that they're 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 screwing that that side of the political social aisle I feel is really screwing themselves over because you know and, and I can I can talk about this with Star Wars too <laughs> because a lot of what they do and this is you, you people begin to see memes about this where you see those memes that it's like it's the gay person you know the the flamboyant type going like, oh, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay, I'm gay, and then you're going, um, got, you have any other personality traits? Because that's that's not the, a person's sexuality, you know, as we have been all hammered over us before, is not a concern of anybody outside of that person and their sexual partner. Mm-hmm. And now you're seeing like these people that basically they grew up, you know, under push. And they just kind of like, you know, it was like, oh yeah, well, what, go gays, you know, and, but, and now like, there, you had that whole, you had the people going, it's a slippery slope, my friend, it's a slippery slope, and a lot of us going, dude, slippery slope to what? And now I, you know, and, and now a lot of people are like, well, what happened to that whole, we just want to live our lives and we're not going to shove it down your throats thing because this is obviously, you know, not that. Yep. So, the cultural backlash and the cultural awakening, some of this kind of stuff, to, to people seeing the reality of what is effectively leftist, you know, like, not liberal, but hardcore leftist ideology, uh, I, I think is going to be very telling for the future, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Because, oh, absolutely. You know, people don't pay attention until you make them pay attention. And the left, especially the LGBTQAIPP plus political movement, has been going insane. Like, insane. Uh-huh. Right? Because the Western world doesn't really oppose, they don't oppose gay marriage anymore. Like, they don't oppose a lot of this other traditional stuff. So now, the, so now that your typical, like, the good vibes type of thing like yeah I support gay marriage of course like it's it's you know man equal rights which is a, a, a valid thing to support it, it's now turned into like let chill let let babies transition to like babies don't have gender like what and then they go pedophile is just a sexual orientation they're, they're just you know they're ageist you know like if the average person gets awakened into the bullshit because then when they go online and go, man, Last of Us 2 sucked, that Abby character was really weird, and all of a sudden, you know, then the world starts saying that you're just a sexist, bigoted, homophobe, and you're like, no, the game just sucked. Like, mm-hmm. you, know, you only didn't like the game because of, you know, your sexist, bigoted, homophobe. It's like, no, your story writing was ass. That, that, that can't be it. You just didn't like it because they had that concept of blame it on all the is for a long time because for a long time the is were the ones that were the culturally dominant power you know, I feel you yeah the 90s, you're, you're, you know, the, the Christian right was what the radical left is now oh yeah Except for the Christian right never had nearly as much power as the radical left does right now if the, you know if, if the Christian right because their their demands are also less insane until it got to the gay marriage, people were just like, "Yeah, we probably shouldn't have titties in, in, on TV. That that makes sense. I, yeah, I get that." Or you know, no, things probably shouldn't be as violent. Mm-hmm. You just you know what 
for most people is like reasonable things and then gay marriage like turned a lot of people off of the culturally Christian community because they uh, I, I think you know they as much as I understand their argument I understand the social implications of a lot of the stuff that they said I, I think they were wrong mm-hmm. and you know and now we're seeing the pendulum swing uh, but like I said I think it's super funny because things like The Last of Us 2 are just proof positive that the, le- the left doesn't know how to actually handle power without getting to totalitarian that's just, just how it goes any criticism of The Last of Us 2 that's just how it goes man uh, what yeah, was what's your, what's your opinion I just kind of rambled like ridiculously on it no you're good um first off it is a terrible game just okay. Well, gameplay is fine. It is what it is. It's just the story is an absolute trial. Makes no sense. I'll put it to you this way and just give you the short Cliff Notes version. Basically, Abby wants to kill Joel for killing her father. So she kills Joel. Ellie goes to try and kill Abby. Fails. Abby lets her go instead of killing Ellie. And then months later, Ellie is like, I'm going to go kill Abby again. And then basically goes to try and kill Abby. She saves her from like this, this prison camp. Tries to kill her then again in a final battle like boss fight sequence and decides to let her go after biting off two of her fingers. And then that's the end of the game. That's even more stupid than I thought it was. No, it's it's quite possibly stupid. And then the entire time you I'm and at the very end I'm thinking to myself like literally hundreds and hundreds of people die both in terms of your partners your friends etc etc in your you know in the the story for itself and not to mention the people that you kill in this murderous rampage to just try and kill these people and you refuse at the very end to to do the deed like on three separate occasions people and it's just a mount of pile death and despair for quite literally no reason and for all this beauty and all its uh, all its attempt to try and make this a very cohesive story, etc., and trying to shoot Hori and Abby and all of this, and trying at the very end to make something that's just gonna like be something of uh, it's it's incomprehensible in terms of I, I've, I've tried to write many stories and it's very difficult because when you actually read a whole bunch of how to write scripts for instance or how to write stories you you go through a shit ton of drafts before you like if you want to know how like the difference between a good movie and a bad movie i always look at like chris nolan and if chris nolan spends like three years writing a script for instance or on and off for the most part i'm probably thinking it's probably going to be a pretty good movie and the last one that he did that took him a couple years was well, Tenet, they came out this year, and uh, the last one, Dunkirk, you know, and those are very well-done movies. And yeah, but, I mean, also with Dunkirk, you got to think, like, oh, there's literally, you don't have to come up with anything original for it's just Yeah, it's just, it's just history. Well, you come up with less original because, yeah, it's, it's history. But I, 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 I 100% agree with what you're saying. I, I think that, you know, we live in this mass-produced era Well, I guess like and that's why you've seen video games being gutter trash lately. Well, yeah, I, I I see basically just like they wrote one draft, wanted to do their political stuff, and then just spent the last six years perfecting gameplay, and then that was it. But I mean, even then, like you could say their gameplay was garbage. I was fine. Reviews that I that I read on it from like you know the expert gamer review people were like. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, you know, it, there's a lack of depth. Um, well, I, I think I think it's fine personally. If you like the gameplay of the first one, um, but without the emotional intelligence and the emotional capacity that comes along with it, um, then it just becomes mindless gore, obviously. But I mean, it's well, fine. I, mean, I, I think that's probably a reason mm-hmm. why it wasn't why people thought that because they, you know, that's just what comes front and center. You get this violent 
SJWness shoehorned into, you know, a gore fest, and you're like, uh, you wanted there to be more? <laughs> and then, you know. But I mean, that's that's kind of like the, a weird. It's something I'm very much disliking about modern games right now is the, the most popular game in franchises are effectively just roster updates every year with things like Madden and FIFA and 2K and all, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I stopped buying Madden. I'm very happy that it... The- I go back and forth with that, to be honest with you. But it, that, that's another topic for something else. I've gone back and forth many times on it, mm-hmm. and it, to me it comes down to, like, are they getting some value out of their life? And it's like, yes, they are, because they're getting, you know, free education, and it, it's not the college's fault if somebody goes to play basketball and doesn't want a hard degree doesn't want to actually get an education because they just want to fuck off and, you know, play sports mm-hmm. because they think they're going to go pro. Like, sorry, dude, like, you are getting paid. You get a free education, you know. Mm-hmm. I, 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 that's just how I how I view that. But I, but I think it, it's little small issues like this, you know, that are getting shoehorned into everything that has just resulted in this sanitation of you know pieces of art like mo- modern mainstream movies suck right the uh, the marvel movies now that the that the original cast is basically out mm-hmm. uh, like we are already getting indications that they're just going to suck dc movies have always sucked mm-hmm. you know some industry 
And hell, I, I don't know about you, but I didn't know that trade schools existed until after I was in the Navy. No, I knew. I, I, I was perusing through them and trying to see what I wanted to do, and yeah, it took me a while. like an option that, that I was told about when I was graduating. Mm, gotcha. That sucks, brother. Um, yeah, I mean, but, I would have done anything different. Like, I, I have a very high income potential, like, solidly upper middle class, and then I'm going to finish school. That I'm, you know, I took out some student loans to basically reorganize some debt to make it so my wife didn't have to work so that because we have four kids mm -hmm. and you know if she works at night and I'm trying to do college and I've got to deal with four young children and she doesn't work so I'm, but I'm going to come out of school having you know two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree and probably maybe only $20,000 to do hey props to you dog I feel you do your thing yeah, but, you know, get that cheddar yeah mm -hmm. so but I, I just think it, like what we're seeing now, especially with things like The Last of Us and all that, it's just the cultural culmination of the bullshit. And uh, I, I think there's going to be a revolt against it at some point. I really do. Mm -hmm. uh, because you can, you know, the pendulum swings. and But the pendulum has swung so hard in one direction right now. I don't think it's ever culturally swung this hard before. And it does, it, we hardly ever seen, I think historically, not since the Civil War, where culture and politics have been so buddy-buddy as we have, as we see right now. Alright. So I feel I'm, I'm, I'm fucking, I'm, I'm, ex I'm ecstatic about <laughs> it. So what do you want to talk about, brother? Oh, man. What have we gone on? I, I can talk about fucking anything, dude. Yeah, whatever you want, man. Uh, I feel you. Um, I mean, uh, Jefferson yeah. has his problems, but you know he's one of the great founding fathers for a reason. So it is uh, what it yeah, is. I mean, I mean, not not everybody is going to be like a strict creative. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's just that's just how the world is. Like sometimes you, you need those people that like can take someone's idea and expand it further, even if they can't. You know, if if they're the type of person that needs help being, being broke out of the box. Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's also how I am with a lot of with a lot of stuff. Like I'm, I'm very much a like uh, it, I can't come up with something, but if I'm shown how to do something, all of a sudden I, I you know, uh, get it instantly. I know. I feel you. Like, like I'm, I'm a visual learner. I guess is a is the best way to put it with that kind of stuff. But yeah. No, I'm, have you, uh, you have any other social trends you want to talk about? So we've already covered the election. I don't want to beat a dead horse. Nah, to be honest, I've been I've been a little bit out of it. I've just been doing all my history stuff. been reading every single bio biograph bi biographical book I can get my hands on. By the way, the, the Clinton biography, it's pretty fucking terrible, if I'm going to be honest with you. So I don't read that. Uh, I think it's called My Life. Um, it's, in fairness, it's, it's fascinating I mean, his entire childhood is pretty traumatic in a lot of ways um, and really shapes who he is. So I understand him. See, I mean, well, because, like, well, because, like, the whole point of the series, the understanding that I've been doing is just because, like, we, because, I, I mean, obviously, history is objective and subjective, you know, because obviously. Because, like, you can have... There's facts that we know, or at the very least, the closest thing to facts because history is up to the interpretation of, you know, writings from that area and human nature, that we'll, what we guess at that particular point in time. And then it's subjective because, you know, it, it should change with with history itself and, and people itself as culture changes, you know? And, like, like you know, like, C-SPAN has, like, a, a poll every, like, 15 years or something like that for uh, the presidents that they rank uh -huh. and I thought it was interesting first off Obama's 11 so that poll's pretty garbage to me but um, anyways I think the, the more um, we get away from his pre 
presidency and all this kind of stuff, the more people are going to go, wow, he was a horrible human being. Yep. Horrible president. Oh, terrible. And um, because you're going to get all these, like, history, you know. I mean, it's already, it's already started. Oh, yeah. You already have a, an absolute ton of people that are, like, you know, listing off, especially when it comes to, like, immigration, they're listing off all of the abuses that um, Obama did. You know, they, they mm-hmm. called him the deporter in chief for a reason. Mm-hmm. Well, and well, he'll, I think he will be half ass deporting people. Like, it, once we're past Trump and people, you know, or even past him in the, uh, to where, like, okay, he's been reelected, we don't have to worry about his reelection type of thing, and people are kind of breathing a sigh of relief. People are going to stop deifying uh, uh, Obama uh, because I he did so much. If you don't realize just how much Obama did, mm-hmm. and I honestly think that he is the reason why the media is just so open and blatant and brazen about what they do now. Oh yeah, right? absolutely. Because. You know, extrajudicial assassinations dropped more bombs than Bush, took us from two wars to seven. You Mm -hmm. know, uh, just so much stuff that if it was a Republican, we would all know about. And, you know, I I think Obama was a big wake up call for people because he was a bad president. Mm -hmm. He, you know, the Fast and Furious thing, the, the targeting of political opposition of the IRS, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that, it, you know, the, the further we get away, like, if that's the norm, and that's what we're returning to, we're returning to the media being in bed with politicians and not calling them out, like, mm-hmm. I, I would take the chaos of the Trump administration forever, because I don't think that the media should be, um, doing what they're doing and I, and I honestly think that the, that the media for what they're worth is is gonna it has screwed themselves over with how they've treated Trump mm-hmm. uh, because you're gonna get to Biden and people are gonna you know they're gonna want to see the same kind of, should I mean I might, I might be overestimating CNN and mm-hmm. <laughs> but they're and people who still read the Brian Stelter. I'm yeah, just kidding. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say, though, is uh, history will look very... If history is honest... Uh, and, and that's a big reason why, too, because, I mean, right now we look at Obama, in, at least in the C-SPAN poll, for instance, is 11, but, you know, I think history looks... He was not ranked, because uh, he wasn't on it the last time they did a C-SPAN poll. So basically, they do it like I said every fifteen years. So. I mean, even then, that that's a big indicator. Like we just had Obama, and people. Oh no! And. By Obama right now, like, was, he's only ranked as number eleven today. And and and. It, in fairness, I watched a, a, a lecture on it when they were uh, unveiling uh, the presidents and their new rankings. And one of the pe- one of the people was basically like, "Look, this is purely, for the most part, at least, just a reaction of the the current new president." Because I think that was about 2018 when when they uh, when they when they taped that. So uh, he's obviously going to be ranked in a little bit biased for just the two reasons: the fact that he has two terms, and um, you know, the Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just he did stuff that brought a lot of disunity. You know how how do you become the first black president and you make race relations worse, right? Because mm-hmm. he did. Um, it, that's that's like an indisputable fact. He made race 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 relations work worse. I mean Obama. I mean Obama before he became president was. 
I'd probably say strictly moderate with some social lefty leanings, especially when he was a state senator and then a, a congressional senator as well, especially with a lot of things he was trying to legislate too. And he has a fascinating upbringing. Have you read, have you read his biography? I have not read his biography, but I know quite a bit about his upbringing. He was essentially raised in Hawaii uh, by his uncle and his mom. Well, by his well, grand. Well, for the most part, by his grandparents, because his grandparents yeah. took over a lot of his uh, his upbringing. His dad's what from Nigeria or uh, one of the I forgot yeah. Kenya. Yeah, one of those countries. And Mm-hmm. He didn't have the upbringing of a tip, like a typical African American, um, you know, somebody like that's in the you know what the what do they call it? the descendant of slave community, descendants of slaves community. Mm-hmm. Um, neither has I mean, like don't even get me started. Mm-hmm. I swear to you, know, one of the first Indian American slaves. <laughs> Yep, I feel you. I know about a lot of the stuff with uh, Michael Flynn for the most part. I'm up to date on that. So that's a very fascinating trial, by the way. You, you should probably. If, if, yeah. My lordy. I agree. I feel you, dog. I don't know. I go back and forth though, but I, I, 
the whole reason why I'm doing the understanding thing though is is like the more I, I, I read all these biographies and I read all these research papers and articles and just look at things for what they are as facts sometimes or interpretations of the, of the facts um, I don't know if history gets things oh thank you Don't worry, I, I I have my subjectiveness to it, but it's. Yeah, but you know, I, I'm of the opinion that you should get subjective after you've gotten objective. You want you know, that everybody is entitled to their opinion, but they should at least start from the basis of knowing, fully knowing and embracing the objective facts about the situation. Dude, I just finished Jackson, and, and I think that's probably gonna be about five hours long. Like it's, it, I'm not gonna lie to you because I finished Jackson, and Andrew Jackson is one president that I really wanted to do because, because you know, because I mean they're trying to take him off the goddamn twenty dollar bill, and I'm like, well he's on there for a reason, you know, and. Well, cause, well, well, I, well, cause, cause I look at it in the. Well, here's how I look at it, though. I look at that specific thing as because you have to understand for thirty years, Spain had control of Florida, and if it wasn't for the British or the French, huh? Wasn't it three hundred years? Well, three hundred years, but specifically after you know American independence, because. Uh, it starts with the, the Louisiana Purchase because when Jefferson bought that, they thought they had Florida as well. It was like because Spain at that point was under Napoleon because he had appointed his own, yeah, you know, Napoleon hope. Yeah, and but they thought that. Oh man, Napoleon is also a fantastic piece of history. Yeah, I, I plan to I plan to do him out of after the presidents. I plan to do him out of on Bismarck and and Hamilton as the next three uh, after that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't blame you. I, cause I, I, um, I really liked him and historically, and I really liked Churchill. Churchill. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, he unified them. Yeah. He unified yeah, them I through political prowess, basically. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's all power, too, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's deeply fascinating, I feel you. Oh, yeah, well, because the whole point being that I wanted to look at it through the context of everything, and... Specifically, you know, for let's just say hypothetically, ever since the Louisiana Purchase in uh, 1803, 1804, around that range, basically Spain had Florida, and with rising tensions all around, basically there's because you have to understand America's still raw. They're still kind of like there's a whole bunch of other nations that are trying to take over America at that particular point, and even after, the, and even then, you have to understand too because the whole. Because after basically like eight after the War of eighteen twelve, and you know the idea of yeah, oh yeah, and very fascinating. Yeah, absolutely, I plan to do episodes on just wars and periods of time too. Um, but specifically though, like I understand, you have to understand the Spanish mindset where you know they're losing control of a lot of their colonial powers. You know, especially later on in Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, in Europe to basically backwater and they have not recovered. Oh yeah, and then and and 
and you know it's just the threat of republicanism and this idea of republic is is a threat to the autocracy and aristocracies in a lot of senses to a lot of these you know imperial powers which is why when like you know the 30s 40s and 50s start happening you see a whole bunch of these liberal uh, i guess you could say revolutions and republics trying to pop up all across yeah No, like a, like a liberal. It was, it was like because we live in a liberal government in the essence of liberty based ideology. Yeah, there was no liberty back then until America came along and the locking ideals. Yeah. Um, I mean, and then the French, as they do with everything, fucked it up. What's well, the French? They Come on, man. It's the French. Like, they got French fries <laughs> and mac and cheese. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They, they were really good fighters, and then, you know, Mustache Man nipped the ever living crap out of them. It's, well, um, the, well, the French Revolution is something else entirely. And it's so, it's, well, it's very different than the actual American Revolution based on different ideals and different yeah. ideas, interpretations of liberalism. And the fact that they had their monarch there instead of thousands of miles away didn't help. So, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The French Revolution was, you know, early stage communist revolt. Mm-hmm. Um, and it didn't start that way, which is what really sucks, because it, it started as very close to the American Revolution. Mm hmm. Oh, absolutely. You know, but a totalitarian, authoritarian who said, you know what? I'm the king. Uh-huh. History history is beautiful and fascinating. Um, but you have to, but, you know, for basically the better part of 30 years, it's. Yeah, what's up? Yeah. Well, it. I, I, I've only. Well, I was. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He, he wasn't that small. Um, I, I, I generally agree with that. He's between 5'6 to 5'9, but I lean towards 5'9. So I, I, I feel you. Um, Yeah, and, and that, that's why I generally agree with, with the 5'9 uh, height. Um, but anyways, uh, basically, for 30 years, for the most part, um, Spain basically just let all the Indians run wild and run amok with that particular terra, territory. As, you know, the the settlers are trying to basically, ter- you know, get around to that Florida area, the West Florida area that was very in a contentious period and point that they're trying to settle into and they're constantly being attacked, which is why Andrew Jackson kinda just becomes a little bit of a, you know, shit kicker for the most part. And and don't get me wrong, I like the Trail of Tears is horrible, but then when you understand the totality of a whole bunch of different Indian attacks and the actual battles that go along with it from you you wanna understand how how vicious the natives were, you should look at a uh, William There's a. Yeah, William. William. William Henry Harrison is. (laughs) Yeah. Um. I I I thought his episode. 
I, if I'm gonna be honest, I thought his episode was gonna be pretty short, but his episode might be pretty long. Um, just his entire battle with the natives. There's actually one ex one expedition that he goes to, or that he's a part of, and he reaches his fort. And by the time he reaches his fort, like 400 people are dead. Pregnant ladies are been disemboweled, and the embryos of you know the the fetuses and the kids and whatnot. And the kids have basically just had their skulls smashed in, scalped, and you know just it. Most, in, well, in fairness, most were savage because if they weren't, you know, fighting the settlers, they were fighting each other for the most part, unfortunately. Oh, absolutely. Those are those guys are peaceful. Mm-hmm. Is is your interpretation of the Christian culture 
worse than oh like the law. yeah oh the babies are so cool they did they did drugs and all this yeah they they sacrificed babies <laughs> they sacrificed humans and virgins yep and it killed innocents for no reason so really is what they is what the Christians went and stopped any worse than you know it was it better than what what ended up coming there and where you now because based off of you know Protestant work ethics the entirety of you know uh, Scandinavia which they were all they were they were all Lutheran for that that was very uh-huh. history. but they wound up being some of the most prosperous and industrious people and guess what they don't sacrifice babies anymore uh-huh. you know everybody shits on the on like the Western world and the Christian world but they never wants to think about what the world would be like without them uh-huh. you know uh, to, to, to me it's just fucking mind, 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 mind. yeah that's that's definitely like kind of goes in with Jackson. Like he did the hard shit that we would that I don't think we would have the balls to do today. Well, and, and you know he 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 made a choice for the most part, and especially once the the first I believe at that point the second Seminole Wars would eventually end. He made a significant choice to eventually just say they're gonna be coming, the settlers and the white man. So you gotta dip if you want to have an opportunity to save your tribe there's actually a lot of letters and a lot of correspondence with not uh, jackson and a couple other of uh natives of, of punchless tribes um the seminoles and um um i forgot what, what other sp- a significant tribe uh, a lot of them actually thanking jackson for effectively saving their people for the most part because their entire existence would not be here today especially today, um, without Jackson making that very, you know, serious and although pretty jacked up decision, very strong yeah. decision. And, and I, th- mm-hmm. oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I think the problem with Jackson too is like he's not what most people would really consider a Democrat specifically, including some Democrats would actually hate him. To be quite honest well, with you, he kind of reminds. He actually. One hundred percent. Like what Democrats really are is hidden today, right? They mm-hmm. Democrats back then, even under Jackson, they were anti-bank. Mm-hmm. People when it came to economics, right? And they were also they, they they were more states' rights, but only when it came to what they wanted. Mm-hmm. There's not much difference between you know the Jacksonian Democrats, uh, you know, when you adjust for modernity, mm-hmm. and today's Democrats, right? Like they're they're really objectively speaking, there really isn't the only thing that's the only two big things that have really changed is uh, they states' rights has been championed much more by Republicans, and the Democrats went from being you know they're still collectivists, they're just collectivists towards everybody else, not white people, mm-hmm. instead of being you know collectivists for just white people. Well, it's interesting too when you look at like the history of both the political parties and how they've basically grown. Because I, I would argue that, like, both Democrats and Republicans have kind of been, like, in some weird inner turmoil for the better part of, like, 150 years until both parties have been functionally established in, in the specific party where, where they, uh, they've really become. Like, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think Democrats really became the, the Democratic Party that we see today until, I would probably say, JFK. And then, obviously... Oh no 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 I, I no I agree with that. My my point though is is for uh, l- let me put it to you this way. In the seventies with Nixon, you had basically like three different I would actually argue four different sects of the Republican Party that were all vying for control and power. 
okay? Because you had the moderates, the Nixons, basically. Then you had the conservatives like Barry Goldwater and Nick or and, and Reagan, and then you had the the very liberal, basically borderline socialist ones. I don't want to say socialist, but like very liberal. I guess you could say modern liberal, uh, like Nelson Rockefellers and the progressive ones. You know. But the, but the, but but the, but that's my point though is is internal conflict for basically the better part of several decades for the most part for especially for like Republicans because the moderate like Eisenhower I don't even know what he is ideologically he's all over the place to be honest with you it's actually kind of funny when he actually was was a uh, appointing a bunch of Supreme Court justices because I think I think I think ironically Supreme Court justices. Uh, you know, imitate for better or worse the actual ideologies of a president, and unfortunately, he ended up really appointing a lot of very liberal leaning judges. So, you know, I just think it's well, I think I it's mean, funny. But I, I think, like, we are two people, people today, and I think you're making the same mistake, are too liberal in the sense that we're not too It's never changed.
uh, or even Dixiecrats, right? So the, the Southern Democrats. Mm-hmm. They, outside of the racial stuff, you know, they wouldn't be, they, they would agree with the Democrats today, right? Conservative or liberal on a lot of stuff. If you, if you took economic policy and all that kind of stuff in general, political um, decisions and things like that, if they would, they would agree the same way. The, the biggest thing that's the different now than it was in the past is the fact that we have we have such a hard culture war, which we, the last time we saw something like that was during the Civil War when everything became sectionalized and you had, you know, pro-slavery Southern Whigs within the Whig Party basically destroyed itself because of Zachary Taylor, which that dude's fascinating huge leader in the Mexican-American War. Um, he owned slaves. He got elected by the Whigs in the 50s because they were like, all right, you know, we want somebody that the South will vote for. And he, the South was like, oh, yeah, this guy's not going to turn against us. Fine, sure, great. And then he, he became, like, super anti-slavery, super abolitionist. But then he died. Um, and then Fillmore, his VP, was this dude from the north who then became like super pro the fugitive slave laws and all that kind of stuff and it's just funny because you have this dude from the south uh, being like pro uh, you know abolitionist causes and free soil causes mm-hmm. and stuff like that he dies gets replaced by his, uh, somebody that's like you know bringing in the army into Boston to, to reclaim fugitive slaves mm-hmm. Absolutely. I feel you.